Hello, welcome to workshop number two, housing design, the significance of good quality design in developing sustainable, innovative, affordable housing. Our speaker for this workshop are Dr. Gonzalo Lizardo, professor at the School of the Architecture, University de Montreal, Dr. Rania Abdurramadan, head of the department of the Architectural Middle East University, Engineer Payman Byron, uh, Managing Director, PMB Consulting Engineers. Workshop. Um, thank you very much, Ali, for this introduction and for your invitation. I really appreciate it. I spent a year working in Cape Town many years ago, and this workshop reminds me of very good memories I, I have of that time working in Cape Town and the Cape Town townships. Uh, my uh, presentation today is a reflection on informality in developing countries. Uh, I'm going to be talking about case studies in other places of the world, but hopefully this will resonate with uh, things that you will find also in, in Africa and, uh, and in many other places of the world, but, but ho hopefully this will be issues and, and I will tackle some of the challenges that also exist in most places in Africa. So this is a reflection about the links between vulnerability and housing, and particularly in the informal sector. And this is part of the work we have been conducted, conducting with the Canadian Disaster Resilience and Sustainable Reconstruction Research Alliance. And this has been funded mostly by the Quebec and the Canadian government. So it's a pleasure to present this to you, not only as my personal research, but as part of, a, of, of the work of, of a team of, of researchers. Uh, some of the ideas I'm gonna present here have been published already in, in three publications, uh, Rebuilding After Disasters, The Invisible Houses, and hopefully um, this, this latest book that is gonna be out in, in a few weeks on natural disasters. Um, so if you want to go further in these issues, I will invite you to, to to read these, uh, these publications. Well, the main argument, I guess, of my presentation is that the informal sector constitutes a big chunk of the uh, housing development in, in developing countries. It's certainly the case in Africa, but it is a sector that is often overlooked by government policy. It's often, often overlooked by housing formal programs, and it is still largely misunderstood by academics and scholars. So it, it constitutes a great percentage of what we build in our cities, but we barely understand it. That's kind of the main argument here. And to, in order to build sustainable, innovative housing in developing countries, we need to better understand what's going on in the informal sector. Well, first of all, what is what are those millions of people building informally? Um, I'm gonna tell you the story of what happened in uh, Caribbean country called Haiti in 2010. In 2010, you probably remember there was a major earthquake that destroyed the capital city of Haiti, Port-au-Prince. It is estimated that something between 60,000 and 200,000 people died in that earthquake. Just after the disaster, there was major destruction in housing, the housing is stuck in the city. Um, and NGOs and international agencies rushed to Haiti to try to work on housing issues. One of the things that, one of the initiatives that were developed was called Building Back Better. This was funded by the Clinton Foundation, President, American President Clinton and his foundation. And the idea was to build uh, ideal model houses for Haitians to rebuild. So the Clinton Foundation invited about 16 top international construction companies to build housing in Haiti. This is one of the prototypes that were suggested for rebuilding in Port-au-Prince. So in a place called Soranje, uh, the idea was to build a model city with ideal, sustainable, innovative housing for Haitians. Well, when we visited the Building Back Better uh, initiative, we found there were all types of innovation houses made of plastic, prefabricated houses, houses made of industrialized panels. But when we visited Soranje, when we visited this, what was supposed to be a model neighborhood, we found that it didn't work. Nothing happened. 
There were about 16 top companies working in developing this settlement, and yet none of those houses were sold. None, absolutely no houses were sold. People didn't want to move to this place. This was only about four kilometers away from Port-au-Prince. So it wasn't actually that far. What happened? Why people didn't get interest in Zorangi? Why these companies failed in providing their low-cost housing solutions for Haiti? Well, what we found was something quite dramatic and interesting. A few kilometers away from Zorangi, so we, now we're talking about 11 kilometers away from downtown Port-au-Prince. People started building prefabricated and makeshift houses. Well, it actually started with about 60 families moving there and NGOs is starting to provide services for these 60 families. So they started providing healthcare and water, temporary water infrastructure. So 60,000 families eventually became 300, 1,000, 5,000. It is estimated that today in this area called Canaan, there are about 300,000 people living. You hear me well, 300,000 people. This was a place where there was nobody before the earthquake. Before 2010, there was nobody living here. This was a rural area. And today is home to 300,000 Haitians. What happened? Why did people move to Canaan to build informally instead of buying these houses that were provided by the Clinton Foundation? This is kind of the starting point of a research we conducted a few years ago. And I'm going to try to draw some of the conclusions that we found. Well, first of all, people totally overlooked the informal processes that were going on. This is a market in Port-au-Prince. This is actually what they call a ravine. This is kind of a water drainage in, in the city, in the middle of the city. This, this water kind of sewage, open sewage system uh, goes through the city. Well, it happens that in the, in the dry season, when there is no water in the drainage system, women start coming here at 6 a.m. in the morning and they sell rice and they sell clothes and they sell spaghetti and they sell everything you want. It, it becomes a market. By midday, this is a fully functional market. And in the afternoon, it gets dismantled and it disappears. It seems that organizations trying to develop housing in Haiti totally overlook the functioning of the informal economic sector. Well, now I'm gonna change countries. And this is a guy in Colombia, in South America. His name is Muriel. Muriel is an informal builder. And like many other informal builders, he's largely responsible for building our cities. Well, Mr. Muriel didn't go to school. You can see that he is a construction guy. He doesn't even have construction boots or a helmet, but he is actually responsible for building hundreds of houses in a place called Cali in the informal sector in the formal settlement of Cali. Well, Muriel, a few years ago, developed something very interesting. He was building concrete columns like any other guy, but one day he decided to do something different. He took a PVC tube and he cut it in half. And then he developed a system to build rounded columns, rounded concrete columns. And his rounded concrete columns became quite famous in this informal settlement in Cali. So he eventually started having more and more contracts because people appreciated kind of the perfection that he was able to obtain with this. And for Muriel, this was very important because he was traditionally using the wood um, system to build these columns, whereas these plastic PVC um, forms would allow to be used way more time, so therefore al allowed for some economies of scale for his construction work. Well, eventually, M Muriel's son, who I met a few years ago in Colombia, um, went to the university. And by having this informal company, Muriel Sr. was able to pay tuition fees so that Muriel Jr. could study architecture. Well, the nice story is that today, Muriel Jr. and Muriel Sr. are partnering to build more and more housing in Colombia. So 
why don't we understand this? How come that we overlooked people like Muriel? Of course, there are things that Muriel needs to do his job better, but there is innovation and there are intelligent solutions that they are developed bottom up. So we need to integrate probably those informal solutions. Let's go back to Haiti and Port-au-Prince. This is one of the poorest sectors in Port-au-Prince. And this is perhaps the poorest neighborhood in the Western hemisphere is called Cité La Joie. Cité La Joie, as you can see in this picture, is very close to the sea. It actually was built on the sea. It was actually built on land that was, that was reclaimed on the Caribbean ocean. As you can see here, the city started growing and taking part of the coast. And so, so the land got extended uh, by accumulating debris on the, on the coast. So this is where Cité La Joie is built. And when we visit Cité La Joie, we found this. In French, it reads Maison à vendre, which means that this house is on sale. And this raises a question. Who would like to buy a house in this neighborhood? Who would like to move to Cité La Joie? Again, this is one of the poorest sectors in Haiti, and Haiti is the poorest sector, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. Why would someone like to move to live in this informal sector? Well, as it turns out, this is not an exception. There are hundreds of houses in Cité La Joie that are on sale and many people want to come and, and live here. Many people want to come and live here because it's close to jobs, because it's close to services. So there is something that we need to understand and that we don't fully understand. How is this real estate sector, informal real estate sector working? How much does this cost, this house cost? Well, to give you the, the exact figure is about, uh, in, in American dollars, it would be about 1,200 um, American dollars. So 1,200 uh, American dollars. So there are people willing to pay $1,200 to go and live here. What's going on? How is this happening? And how are these houses transferred? We need to understand this if we want to build informal um, sustainability. And this is not an exception either. Uh, this is a pattern that we have found in many other countries. There is an invisible market that we barely understand, but that we need to understand if we want to build sustainable innovative housing. But the problem is that most government and, and public policy is actually ignoring this informal sector. The informal land sector, the informal real estate sector, and the informal construction sector. At least these three sectors have been systematically ignored by politicians and decision making makers in the housing sector. And there is also the issue of invisible infrastructure. A few years after Hurricane Mitch destroyed Honduras, NGOs wanted to build sustainable housing. And they build this type of houses to relocate people that were living in an informal settlement. Well, when we visited this project a few years after houses were delivered free, for free to residents, what we found is that many residents have returned back to the informal sector where they got affected by Hurricane Mitch. And many of them were even went further and were even more intelligent and took with them the roof and the sink and the toilet and the doors and the windows of the houses that were given for them for free to rebuild in the original informal settlement. So it is clear that we're missing something. It is clear that we're not understanding what's going on. And part of the issue that we're not understanding is the role of, of infrastructure. This is Favela Santa Marta in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, Favela Santa Marta received a public project of building a rail, kind of a rail train that goes all the way up to the high in the mountain to the favela. Well, when we visited and worked in Favela Santa Marta, what we found is that infrastructure played a crucial role in the housing sector. It was not about building houses. It was about building this type of infrastructure. But what happened is that by having this infrastructure, people were able to, to, to develop home-based economic activities. And these home-based economic activities eventually translated into better housing conditions for all. And we know that this is a pattern. We have found this same pattern in Medellin, in Colombia, for example. 
By building infrastructure, we are able to improve housing conditions indirectly because if people have infrastructure, then they will invest more in their housing solutions. They will probably de develop or generate home-based industries, workshops, uh, stores, and, and other economic activities. And this will have enormous consequences in housing conditions, because if people have electricity, well, they can have a venta de pollos, which in Spanish means chicken for sale. So if you can thrive through economic activities, then maybe housing conditions also improve. This is not to say that the informal sector is perfect. There are many problems in the informal sector, and we as professionals and as scholars must tackle them. One of the main issues is vulnerability to natural disasters. And, and, and natural hazards. This is a house in Cali, the place I showed you before, in the informal sector I showed you before. If I don't know if there are some engineers, maybe there are many engineers in the room, you probably understand that that top column in the last floor is, is, is extremely dangerous. There are no connections with columns at the bottom. So it is very clear that today, if there is an earthquake in this part of the city or in Colombia, this house will collapse and it might kill a dozen people. So it is clear that this informal sector needs to be enhanced, needs to be improved. There are issues of security that needs to be addressed. But ignoring the informal sector, overlooking how it works is not the right way of helping it. Because there in, in the informal sector, there is also innovation. If you take a look at this informal house in Cali, you will notice that this woman took a bottle of Coca-Cola a plastic bottle of Coca-Cola and she inverted it and cut it and put it to a pipe and now she's collecting rainwater and by collecting rainwater she's able to water the plants and she's able to function her toilet. So there is kind of informality, there's kind of innovation in informality that we are also overlooking and we need to understand this innovation if we're going to build sustainability in informal settlements. And we need to understand those invisible powers generating that informality. This is Caratas, an informal place in Cuba, in the Caribbean island of Cuba. And Caratas has been built on what is now being affected by sea level rise. So Caratas is now at risk of flooding uh, due to sea level rise caused by climate change. So the government is trying to relocate those villagers to what they call secure housing. And that means moving people to apartment buildings inland. But these people are refusing to go. People like this uh, guy, they are refusing to go. These fishermen want to build close to the ocean. They are deeply connected to the ocean, not only because of their economic activities, but because they have been raised close to the ocean. They have emotional and sentimental attachments to the sea and they are refusing to relocate. They are starting a movement with local leaders to prevent relocation. So once again, we need to understand this informal power relationships if we want to deal with housing. We're not going to be able to deal with housing if we are not if we do not fully understand those informal power relationships. This is an informal settlement in Colombia again. And you know what these people are interested in? In building a soccer pitch. That's what is important to them. When we went and talked to them about housing, they said yes, this was this will come later. We want a soccer pitch. Well, they got the soccer pitch and there are significant improvements in the settlement once they reach that infrastructure they need. Infrastructure for recreation, infrastructure for having clean water, for having waste disposal. And many times it's not about houses themselves as this other project demonstrates. Quite often when people receive funding, in this project people actually receive cash, they invested in things that have nothing to do with houses. They invested in having a better water uh, roadway to, the, to their house, or they invested in the roof, or in septic tanks, or in infrastructure. This other guy, for example, invested in what we call in Spanish a beneficiadero. That's kind of a workshop where you can treat seeds that are part of agricultural activities. So it is quite often not about dealing with houses themselves, but about dealing with the infrastructure and the conditions that allow people to develop economic activities.
In another case, in another city, this is facetativa, something interesting happened. The mayor wanted to build houses, but he didn't have the money. So what he decided to do was to build half houses. Uh, this is what this looks like when you, in an aerial view, but this is actually what he developed. In black, you see the part of the house that he was able to build. And the white walls represent what people could do later. So what he decided to do is to build half houses, not the complete house, but only half of it. And people would have the opportunity to finish in the house. When we visited this project a few years later, we found that it was a huge success. People did engage in the idea of finishing the houses and, and completing the houses. And very quickly, this was the space that was left for people to build. And years later, there was already construction going on. And very soon, people finished and completed their houses. Because again, it was not only about the house itself. It was about the opportunity within the house of producing economic activities. And many people like this woman, for example, she engaged in economic activities based on their, her home. So she decided that the living room would become, was becoming a saloon for you know, cutting hair and, and, and doing her business. And, and eventually with that money, she was able to finish the rest of the house. We know now that this model has been used in many other places like Chile, you probably recognize this project um, by the architect group Elemental, which eventually consisted in building half houses and allowing people to finish their houses. I know that there has been um, uh, a similar project in, in, in South Africa. I just forgot the name of the great architect who conducted that. If someone remembers the name of that great architect, please, uh, I would love to, to remember that. But we know that this principle of, of, of involving the informal sector to finish the units have been used in other places. So in conclusion, the real challenge is not about building houses, but about creating the conditions in which individuals and social groups can live lives they have reason to value. And this should be our top priority. This must consider an approach to social justice. At the end of the day, it's about social justice, isn't it? Decentralizing decision-making power, integrating heterogeneous institutions, and including the informal construction sector, which is, I believe, the most powerful housing industry force we have to work with. The informal construction sector is probably the most important industry we need to integrate if we want to build sustainable, innovative housing in Africa. It requires the sustained engagement of all the stakeholders, not just community participation, but real engagement in, in action, informal workers being invited to participate, informal builders being involved in housing policy, in housing programs. As professionals, we can improve the living conditions of millions of people in Africa and abroad. If we accept this engagement, if we try to, if we stop trying to simplify housing issues, if we stop trying to see them as a problem of building houses, and we embrace the tensions that emerge and the trade-offs that are required today in disaster risk reduction. So if we want to reduce vulnerabilities and reduce the risk that informal people living in conditions of informality be affected by natural hazards, we need to understand that housing is a key component. But in order to improve housing conditions, we need to fully understand this informal sector, embrace uh, its advantages and invite this, this sector to participate in the housing developments that we are going to uh, organize and the housing programs that government will put in place. Thank you very much. This is what I wanted to tell you. Uh, you can do not hesitate to contact me if you have uh, ideas about this. Um, it might be through social media or my email. It will be a pleasure to engage in a discussion with you guys. Thank you very much. Uh, it's just very really fantastic and it's just very um, nice coincidence. Yesterday, we have other workshop for the other project, and we was talking about the case of especially the Cape Town. And majority of the point you highlighted, we just highlighted with some colleagues, which they are here also. The one thing you just mentioned is about the social justice. It's our conclusion 
uh, from yesterday workshop, which we just are still working about the uh, relation between density design and well-being in the informal settlement or in the city. The other point we just highlighted and you just uh, clearly uh, explain about that one is just a flexibility of houses. Sometimes the people, they don't have the money to just buy the whole house, especially when we're just talking about the low income or middle level income. So it's just a nice thing as an architect and engineer, we just try to provide the half house, then extend it. And we have a survey and we just see the informal settlement clearly explained they want a place to extend the house. So it's just very nice things. The other things you just mentioned is just uh, about the adaptation, which is just so also is same things. We just reach about that one. Community participation is just the other good point you just uh, highlighted about that one. So in the uh, University of Cape Town, we are just trying to working on the theory of the community-based facility management. And some of my colleagues in this uh, workshop, they're experts about that one. So I just invited them to just come and just explain about those community-based FM and how it's working, because this is very important. Sometimes we forgot we are just making a house for who mm. is very important. You know, the needs of the people in Africa maybe is different to the needs of the people in the Asia. So we need to just listen to them first, and then we just start to uh, make a house for them. Thank you very much. I know you are just coming from the very early time in the morning in the Canada. I really appreciate that one. Thank you for without, the invitation, Ali. Sure, thank you. Without uh, further ado, we just try to invite Professor Abdul Ramadan uh, to just start uh, her uh, presentation. But, but uh, I see a few very nice questions and like uh, conversation happen in the chat. So if you uh, can please answer some of that one in the uh, case we don't have a time for the Q&A at the end of the session, so at least you are able to answer some of these questions. Uh, Prof, uh, are you here? Yes, yes. Hi, Dr. Ali, how are you? Sorry for that, but I I have something uh, it's not as strong with my camera. So yeah, um, um, so thank you for your for invitation. Thank you for these opportunities to, uh, you know, to, to start and to talk about my uh, expertise. Actually, my background, I'm Rani Abu Ramadan from Jordan. Uh, my background, uh, I'm an architect and uh, my specialty is in sustainable development uh, and uh, refugee studies. Uh, I don't know, uh, shall I share or? Um... Yes, please, if you. Yeah. And I put the uh, CV of uh, Prof in the chat. So if you are interested to read the details of her CV is in the chat already. If you have any difficulty, I can just run oh, it from I my can. That's fine. I'm just share. Uh, I don't know. Yes. Can you see my my? Uh, yeah. Okay. So actually, I'm um, <clears throat> as I, I said, I'm uh, my background is I'm an architect. I'm um, head of uh, architecture department uh, in uh, Middle East University, and um, actually uh, because my background is about the architectural engineering. So thank you for Dr. Ali to invite me to share my knowledge and my experience. And um, I'm, you know, I'm, uh, as well, I'm trying to put my expertise in sustainable development uh, to relate with the, uh, what happened in, uh, with the refugee study. And as you know, uh, Jordan in Middle East and MENA regions, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, in, in war zone and there's a lot of uh, uh, difficulties and challenges um, uh, are, you know, the refugee facing e every day and especially for the in construction um, um, side or in architecture side in general or in social uh, aspect and so on. 
So uh, mainly my presentation, uh, I will go through the, uh, the ch this is challenging of our challenges of developing housing, and uh, uh, I will uh, I want to share my knowledge regarding to the meth methodology uh, about to find this solution, find solution for these challenges by using the specification approach and uh, criteria development. So here, uh, I, I want to, um, I'm trying to, to, to say something about the background, the contextual background from the previous uh, practices, especially in increasing number uh, of housing or, or dwellings in, 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 in formal settlement, uh, uh, so in, in formal settlement or in city or as a formal city or camp. So this is problem, it's already there, and especially in the low and middle um, income countries. And Jordan, one of this, uh, this country as a, an upper middle uh, income country. So Jordan is facing this problem with the refugees and with the informal settlements in different uh, spots in Jordan, whether in, in the north and the south and east and west. Uh, so, and in this, this, in this, in, um, this problem about the increasing number of, uh, let's say, the, of the vulnerable peoples or the poor refugee, that it's uh, related to the increasing needing of the increasing number of the housing and dwellings. So uh, in, in this term, in this term, so we are I'm talking about the pull and push strategies. It's regarding to um, uh, as the professor. Um, sorry if I pronounce wrong. Lizard, lizard or uh, uh, say something about uh, uh, the economic um, issue, which is very important and. Uh, it's very interesting for me because when I, I, I saw the picture about this uh, area, Canon, uh, please correct me, Professor, if I'm wrong, uh, the name of this area. So uh, this area, it's uh, something, it's, it's, it's before, it's a, it's a desert. There is nothing before, as I understood, uh, uh, 2010. So now it's uh, about the 3,000 people in this area. So I think, uh, and I, as I understood from your presentation, there is the, uh, the factor of economic factor. I think it's the same key, case here in, 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 uh, in Jordan. There is the economic factor, which is it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's regarding to the pull and push strategy between for, to, to find the opportunity for job. And this, you know, it's relating and um, by time it will be uh, effect on the uh, housing and need of this housing or the uh, whether for the uh, refugees or for the uh, uh, other people from the informal settlements. So unfortunately, unfortunately, and from my experience uh, for the refugees, um, uh, you know, uh, the actually the governmental body or the private sector, they are looking for the problem as a temporary and temporary, uh, you know, housing or dwelling. But to, we go to the permanent settlement or the permanent housing. So there is the gap. There is the gap of understanding what happened with these people. There's the gap of to set an, on one table, like, uh, you know, uh, stakeholders, which is uh, include the users or the uh, residents or uh, the governmental body, the private sector, the NGOs, and so on. So I think this is this gap between understanding what exactly people need uh, in terms. It's not just in terms of the uh, uh, building and housing, also in terms of belonging, in terms of adaptation. So I think if from this point, from this perspective. We have to sit down and see exactly people what they are want, uh, not uh, not need, because the needs of people it's a, just a basic need, just a shelter, just a place to to uh, you know uh, to have some security. But by time this need it become wants, it become something about the uh, 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 self estimation and and you know something to to feel to about the belonging and adaptation. 
here the the picture for Amman. There is the it's really it's a crowded, uh, you know, buildings and dwellings of uh, of um, Amman, the capital of Jordan. So as uh, the uh, uh, yeah the numbers uh, I, we can see the number here. There is the estimated. Uh, there are country 1.3 million Jordanian and Syrian living in uh, substandard housing. So, Jordan, the uh, you know, um, Jordan face a, uh, faces a, a really a problem and a crucial problem about this, uh, you know, about this increasing number because Jordan now it's it's a mixing between uh, Jordanian and you know. Uh, refugees or migrants from the Syria, from Yemen, from Sudan, from Iraq, and so on. So the jo the kingdom it needs at least one hundred thousand new housing uh, units. So and because there is a, a, a lot of dif difficulties and a lot of you know challenges and obstacles uh, in front of the government and uh, from the, the you know uh, the decision maker and the policies so i think we have uh, we have to have as a, as a researcher to set to sit down and to see you know uh, there is the um, we have to look at the uh, 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 at this problem and try to find a solution. From this point, um, you know, from this point, um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, this research to find a solution by using the uh, method of specification. So here, this is the this is uh, you know, uh, as I, I said, there is the lack of alignment between the different uh, between the stakeholders between the governmental body between the private sector which is i also uh, it could um, you know includes the 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 needs of the uh, labor market the inconsistent of regulation the taxes the shortage of shortage uh, of uh, resources which is the jordan is the is uh, it, uh, it it listed as the one uh, of this countries um, you know have a, a listed uh, you know and shortage of the resources uh, whether it's the uh, natural resources or non-natural resources so to find this affordable housing housing uh, demand uh, solution for demanding of this housing so the recommendation from the previous study to 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 look at what people needs exactly what people needs so it's not just about what uh, you know uh, just the governmental, what we have. Yeah, we have to look at the governmental, but in, in, in another side, we have to look at, uh, you know, to people what exactly want and what they are need for, for, for the good living uh, condition. So as a, as a, you know, as a, let's say, basic need and wants, I think this is uh, the research. It comes with uh, some idea about the criteria identified from the literature. It's something about the safety and security, something about the comfort. When talking about the comfort and safety and security, too, this is, it's a big topic in different terms. So I, when I say comfort, it's uh, something like uh, regarding to the climate comfort, to the uh, something it's uh, regarding to um, uh, the comfort, the social comfort, and so on. Also, also the social context and stability. So this is two terms. It's really important regarding what exactly people wants because you know at the end of the day, the time is uh, you know um, the, uh, the people by time they. The, the their need it's become like a want it's be, because people want to to stay in the place they can you know belong as i said at the first in the first uh, or the second the slides need to the place to to feel you they are you know belong or adapt or you know integrate with the the uh, the environment also uh, durability for the uh, for this for uh, for the housing or the, the demountable of the housing flexibility and uh, energy here when i'm talking about this criteria i'm talking about the criteria that, that could be fit for the uh, you know uh, for informal settlement for informal city for your camps so this is the criteria so that could 
you know, um, direct us to exactly uh, uh, the core of the research, which is about the specifications. Okay, and uh, relating this specification to criteria. So, wha what is the specification exactly? What, 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 what does mean the specification? And why we need to use this specification? Uh, and how does the specification uh, list work in housing design? For, to answer this question, to answer this question about what is the specification? So, the core of this question it's to set or to uh, let people, uh, stakeholders to set on the same place, the same table, to negotiate, to, to, uh, to discuss exactly people uh, or users, the end users at, at the end of the day, uh, what they want. We can, you know, because you, we cannot just say that uh, this country or this, uh, you know, governmental um, sector or private sector, they have these resources and not. You may, you, yes, maybe sometime we have to be realistic and go and, and see what happened on the reality. But at the end of the day, I think to have people on the table, the end user in the table and ask them and to be as a part of this let's say oh, this game so i think it's important because at the end of the day we cannot apply the top uh, down strategy and i think uh, and at the end of the day as a researcher we have to find something um, in between in top uh, uh, bottom or on bottom or to top strategy otherwise we will have a lot of maybe a lot of the, uh, the housing, but without any, you know, uh, uh, considering to the social, to the belonging, to adaptation and so on. So uh, my research about the specification or to using this specification approach, it's to developing this specification to develop the, this list that uh, or the checklist of requirements that requirements it could you know uh, uh, you know have it from uh, uh, meet people interview people the end user that uh, the, the i meant to and uh, to uh, question them about what exactly want. because at the end of the day we are a human being and we have to look at the different side, different perspective, economically, to, uh, you know, uh, socially, uh, from the culture, you know, from also also the uh, the um, architecture or or design. So, but it's a uh, it's a it's a one framework. We cannot, uh, you know, we we cannot distribute it for just one or two. And in this process of the specification, so we can use it in, in, in five phases and uh, in, in each phase of this, of this uh, uh, specification approach. So we can, you know, refine it each phase based on what exactly people need or, or, or want. So it's a, it's a process to understand what exactly, uh, what, what we need on the ground, but at the end of the day, to uh, refine and to uh, demonstrate the requirement of people need. In discussion, so if of this research, there is the uh, you know, fully understand about there is the gap between exactly what people need, and there is the rigid of report, uh, you know, but by, by the government, okay, and just to put this this solution for people without looking for the def, you know diversity of social context between place to another place also as i, I hear the lack of integration between social and physical physical well-being in the settlement situation so it must be considered in informal settlement in informal city and on, on camps or actually also the donors who want to donate to this housing we must be also set down on the same table and to uh, you know uh, understand what exactly people need and 
Uh, another in, in another point in the discussion, difficulty of finding balance between the financial uh, visibility and the adequate equality of living condition. So I think it must be uh, considered in, 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 this, in this research. As a conclusion of this research, so designing uh, housing, um, you know, it's uh, uh, are organized in an uh, efficient way, but this is not effective because there is the lack of flexibility of building performance. Uh, the, the second point is about the local and governmental body is not considered priority of people. So we can, uh, you know, as I mentioned in the in the in the discussion, so there is the uh, there is the lack of understanding between those between uh, parties of the stakeholders and that they are in, in conclusion developing a specification list it's uh, something like a, a checklist that could be feed uh, for all you know uh, uh, the, uh, for, for the difference uh, you, diversity of uh, understanding or need uh, for people for the housing and demanding of the housing uh, sector so this is uh, what I have. Uh, this is my research core about, um, uh, you know, uh, try to find a solution for the challenge of housing, uh, uh, housing sector, uh, um, uh, uh, and, you know, in terms to provide to them a, a good quality of living condition, whether from to the uh, people in informal settlement or city or in, the, or in camps, because at the end of the day, the people uh, we are a human being in different and in, 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 from a different perspective from different direction from different situation thank you dr ali thank you for uh, to give me this opportunity to share my 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 work and it's a pleasure to be with us uh, in this uh, wonderful workshop thank you very much prof i know you are very busy and i just really appreciate your time uh, you just highlighted very nice things, uh, which we just try to do that one. Even in the other project, we just try to do it. It's just happening. So uh, currently in the South Africa, we are just trying to look at in sort of the private public uh, partnership to just um, involve a private investor and also the community in the designing of their houses. So that's the things is happening. And majority of the point is just raised by the Prof. Lizardo or you is just not only related to the informal settlement or the disaster houses, it's just related to any type of the housing. So when I just try to make my house, I just sit down with the architect, with the engineer to just be sure all the things myself and my family needs is just provided in the design. But why not to the community? So this is exactly the social justice we are just talking about. So we need to just uh, think about that one. Uh, you just mentioned about the gathering the stakeholder around the table. Yes, it's just very true. So uh, COVID gave us that opportunity to just use the virtual uh, system, which can just be a Zoom, MS team, or something like that. And there is no any excuse that uh, we cannot gather the stakeholder around the table and just listen to them. And even in the construction or in the uh, built environment, we are using building information modeling, which we call it BIM, which is exactly the point Lizardo and you uh, highlighted. It's just happening in the digital world to just collect all the information from all the stakeholder and partners put it in the digital uh, system and platform and just be sure we are just address all those needs and all those things we have to do it. So if it's the responsibility of the architect to just design the uh, proper house or is just a responsibility of the engineer to just be look at the structure, electrical, mechanical uh, aspect of the house. So there is no excuse anymore. So now we are just moving to our third speaker, uh, Engineer Byron. Uh, I like to invite Engineer Byron uh, to just come and share uh, your screen and just uh, present your presentation. I uh, okay. So yeah. I, I think stop chair, right? 
Not yet. Yes, now it's just okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dr. Ali. Can you Hi. hear me? Yes, clear and loud. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. So until the uh, engineer uh, Byron is just sharing a screen, we are just traveling, if you are not noticed, from the Canada to the Jordan in Middle East, and now we are landing in the South Africa. There we go. Can everybody see the PowerPoint? Yes, you need only full screen it. Okay, I'm just, I'm going to enter into presentation mode, and then if there are questions, I will answer them later. Uh, me. So put my camera before I do that to turn my camera on. If I can, there we go. Yeah, can you see me? Yes, of course. Good, good. All right. Hi, everyone. So as you see, I'm presenting from home. <laughs> this is my work space away from work. So uh, I'm a structural engineer by profession and uh, I uh, very recently, I opened my own consulting firm. And uh, also I, I, I do work somewhere, I just started, but I'm not really going to discuss that for now. And we focus on the presentation. So the theme of my presentation is housing design, but in the context of uh, structural design. So very much I'm going to focus on a structural design some of the present, this is a presentation outline. I'm not going to uh, speak over all the, all the slides. Some of them I'm just going to whoosh through, but I have included it so for just for the sake of completeness. So this is a little bit about SIA. I'm just skipping these because Dr. Ali explained very well. Um, in terms of the housing design in South Africa, I so that picked up the highlight, highlight of uh, entities that are involved in this, in, in this atmosphere, and they do play a part. This is not all of them, by the way, uh, but is, is the main ones. NRCS, SABS, you read them, we're going to discuss them further. So what is the function bus? Why, what, why we have so many players in South Africa, all one way or other having a hand in regulating or specifying standards in South Africa. This is a typical example of what, when, what happens when uh, engineering principles are not followed. And this is another example. There you see, if you can see my mask here, is a sinkhole caused by a dolomite uh, uh, collapse of the cavity. And uh, as you can see, the horse is still standing, probably thanks to the engineer following the prescribed standards. So talking about South Africa, this is sort of the environment that uh, we function in. As you can see, there is different entities or ministries regulating or having a say in the design of the homes. Public works is one of them here and a very main player, Agrama is part of it, EXA is there, for example, Engineering Council, Council for Architectural Profession. Then you come to Human Settlement with NHPRC and HDA, and then you, you come to NRCS, SANAS, SABS. I'm going to explain why and how each one of these different parts or ministries have a role. It, it has created a little bit of problem in case, in, in a sense that the, the duties are fractured. So you have, instead of having everything in one place, in, in under one ministry, you have, or you get different standards, directive and regulation from different, different ministries. So in a way it's not good because it's fractured and sometimes you get regulation or standards that they contradict each other, but then some of it is necessity because, for example, is, is a case of, how can I say, separating the player and the referee. So SANAS, for example, is a regulator that regulates the uh, validity of the testing. So you don't want the one, the, the person that is going to test the material 
to be reporting, for example, to the same ministry that, how can I say, is going to police the police the construction. So in a way, in terms of good governance, you do want them separate, but they, 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 there is other challenges that they pose in here. Uh, let me just make this a little bit smaller there. Okay, uh, NRCS, National Regulator for Compulsory Specification. So what is their role? So in the next few slides, I'm just going to expand on each main player to give you a perspective of, of what they do. So NRCS creates compulsory standards. So not, not everything is compulsory in South Africa. And, and typically the standards are set out by SABS, South African Bureau of Standards. And, and these standards are not compulsory. That is, that is very important. But then what happens, these non-compulsory standards in terms of the law we're talking, they become compulsory through other legislations and other acts and other directives. And NRCS is one of those regulators that makes a number of the standards compulsory. And, and um, you know, I, I asked Dr. Ali to share the presentation with you so you can have a look at it in your own time. So I'm not going to read the presentation per se. So through NRCS, then, what happens, a series of SABS standards become compulsory in the housing design. And, and primarily is the SANS 10400 series. Now, if you look on the right-hand side, empowered by Act 103 of 1977, these set of standards in South Africa become low. When I mean compulsory, I mean they become low. And they set out deemed to satisfy rules. Now, I'm sure my South African audience and colleagues, they know what deemed to satisfy means, but I just will explain for the benefit of everybody. In simple terms, what it means is that if you do comply with the, uh, with the rules and the standards as is, it's been stipulated in these standards, you're okay. You, you have complied with the requirements in terms of the national building regulation. And the moment you deviate from that, then within 10400, there is a set of other standards that are referred to. So then, you know, the engineer needs to go and look at those standards. And, and you know, to highlight one out of many, there are standards for concrete design, for steel design, timber design, foundation design, pile, piling design, and so on and so on. So, and I, and I highlight this, I wrote here, is 10400 10, compulsory? Is it law? The answer is yes and no. It is not a law in itself, it is not a compulsory in itself, but by virtue of it being ref referenced in a certain regulation, it becomes compulsory. So from the, the, the next main player is NHPRC, my previous employer. Now, they, they, uh, they have a very specific mandate. So the mandate is uh, ensuring quality in housing sector. But then at the same time, they, and I'm maybe criticizing this, but it's got to do not with the organization, but rather with the act that governs the organization where the main focus is the structural performance. So while we have the 10400, you know, talking about energy efficiency and, you know, durability and this and that, and NHPRC's main focus remains the structural performance to make sure that the house does not fall, put it simply. And how do they do that? They publish a home building manual, which sets out the standards. Again, this document is law, is gazetted. It, everybody building a home in South Africa needs to comply to it. And then in terms of the home building manual, there is a series of, or a list of criteria that they, they consider when they assessing, and in particular, I say a new system, a new building method. And I'd like you to remember this list because this list, I want to show you how it links to what Agrima does and how similar it is to what Agrima does. But nevertheless, the 
the main, if you see my mouse, I'm sure you do, the main focus again remains the structural performance, which I sort of put in board. Then if the another player is Salga. Uh, Salga now is an association representing the local municipalities in South Africa. Now, while they can't set, uh, how can I say, uh, they, they can set rules, they can set bylaws. So through bylaws, they can amend the national building regulation. But the, the, the catch is they cannot nullify it. So they can say now, for argument's sake, the, the uh, MBR or the standard, and I'm just purely using this for example, the standard can say the concrete must be a minimum of 20 MPA. The, the, the municipality can come and say, no guys, we're not happy with 20, we wanted 40, you know? So they can actually add up, increase the standard, move to a higher level, but they cannot go below what is what has been set by MBR, the National Building Regulation, and Sunstein 400. But nevertheless, they, they do play a role and they are empowered through the constitution. That is the local authorities. Then is the CSIR, which is the Council for Scientific uh, Research. And they, they publish a book, yeah, which has recently been uh, uh, what you call it amended, updated, revised. So there is a new revision. For your interest, I have included on each slide the reference so you can actually go and download the Red Book for, for free, it's available for free download. And there in the CSIR book, there is a set of guidelines in terms of the town planning and, and social aspects and how the, the planning of a township or a housing design in a perspective of, or in a reference to a community should, should go about doing so. Last but not least is the AGRAMA, AGRAMA South Africa. So they, as you saw earlier, they report to the Minister of uh, Public Works. They are a subsidiary. Uh, there is a link between AGRAMA South Africa and AGRAMA France. And what, what their function is, and very recently, they, 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 in 2015, if you see here, they published the act which gave a statutory position to AGRAMA. So now, in terms of the law, any new building that, that is any new building system or method that is not covered by deemed to satisfy rules and is not covered by SABS standards, then it needs to be assessed by Agrama South Africa. And again, I just put the assessment criteria that Agrama typically would look at in terms of assessing these building methods or uh, building systems, new methods of construction or, or building, and, and very much is aligned to what national building regulations would say if you look at the Act 103 and is in line with NHBRC, what NHBRC says. So, so there is uniformity there is uniform, and that's what I want to highlight. There is uniformity between these different regulators, even though they are reporting to different ministries. So there is a bit of a method in the madness, if you know what I mean. And if you do like to see some of the uh, innovative methods, NHPRC has a housing innovation hub in north of uh, Pretoria. It's called Eric Molovi in honor of Mr. Molovi, the founder and think tank behind NHPRC. And here is an example of some of these uh, uh, innovative building methods or homes that you may find in Eric Molovi, you can see here. Now, who is who? Because I spoke about a lot of things and very fast I know. NRCS, you see them all on the right hand side, NRCS, SAPS, where do all these uh, fit into the, in terms of the law in South Africa? So level one is the Act, Act 103, which sits right up there. Talks high level in terms of the design of a house and not just a structural, being an engineer, my main uh, focus and attraction remains a structural, but it talks generally high level, what does a house or a structure need to comply to? Then it comes to level two, which is the national building regulation that NRCS sets them. And it, it sets the functional requirements. 
saying, for example, the house needs to be uh, waterproof, it doesn't have to catch, it, it shouldn't catch fire, uh, or if, if it does, it should, you know, the function in a certain manner. Then is the performance requirement, which is the SANS 10400, and combined with NHBRC, you know, SABS and NHBRC have a say, and, and, and in terms of the evaluation of a system or a method, a construction method we're talking here, uh, there, is a, there is a number of ways how to do that. And prime, the first test is 10400. Is the system deemed to satisfy? Is this house deemed to satisfy? Yes or no? If it's yes, no problem. If, it's, if the answer is no, then a competent person, in this case being uh, an engineer, uh, because uh, you know, we're talking about the structural design. Obviously, you know, if you're talking about other aspects of the house, such as architectural design for argument's sake, then the competent person would be the architect, but our focus for now is, is a structural design. The, the competent person by way of applicate, ap applying engineering principles would prove that this house is a structurally okay. And, and the last is by way of expert opinion and judgment, which is that's where the agrama comes into the picture. At the end, I'm, I'm including a set of resources where you, know, you can find more information about these different entities and how they function and how they relate. And last but not least is the questions. So uh, Dr. Ali, I'm done. And I'm going to mute for now. Thank you very much. So we have uh, time for just some uh, question. I see a lot of nice question and like um, uh, conversation happening in the chat. So I'm not sure, do you want to just read that phone or I just rather to open the um, uh, participant to just talk because we have like a 15 minutes and it's just very good times to just uh, use this time to uh, talk together instead of I read the question. The only things I just highlighted before we just go to the Q&A or to the um, discussion, uh, you highlight a lot of rule and regulation. My background is also engineering. So I know for the structure engineering or for designing the structure, electrical, mechanical, we have a, lots of rule and regulation we have to follow. Same things in the architecture, same things in the QS and the other uh, professional in the building. But the question I raise it and put it in the chat, how about the social? Do we have any standard for the social housing or for the social needs of the family? Uh, so far, I don't see any of them. I just know some of them is just architect try to uh, address that one, like a size of the family, size of the bedroom, size of the house, passive design, ventilation. It's how far is just back to the technicality of the house is not back to the well-being of the family. So that's the point. And I see here, one of our participants, he just raised that one and say, this is the gap, we need to fill it. So now I just uh, open the, uh, let me just open, can you just uh, stop your sharing? So- Can, can I control? Yes, can right. Yeah, can can, can just if, do something. So anybody wants to talk, it's just the floor is open. You can just unmute yourself and just uh, raise your question or just share your idea in the comments, please. Yeah, sorry, Ali, for that, but uh, because I'm 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 really uh, actually frustrated from this point, especially for my 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 research with the refugees, and uh, this is it's, uh, the one uh, or the important part of my research, uh, research uh, uh, you know, on the BHT and still now. So the point of the social aspect, which is that it's really important, it's really important and it's really, it's, uh, you know, ignoring one, 
ignoring point from the NGO and the governmental body and, you know, private sector. Unfortunately, P, uh, uh, NGOs, let's say, to say something about the camps or informal settlement. So NGOs at the, uh, at, the, um, 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 uh, uh, at the beginning, they are looking for the emergency solution. Then this emergency solution to go to, go to the temporary solution. But by time, this solution, it become permanent. But no one take any attention or caring about the social aspect. Why? Because, you know, maybe they... they Maybe because they are not on, um, you know, on on the ground, they are not feeling that what exactly those people feel. Because at the end of the day, the, the, the day we are a human being. We are we need to to uh, you know uh, to use this housing or this dwellings or this shelter and to to feel about uh, you know to feel we are uh, at home or we are to feel we are on on you know on on. Um, with our community to belong to adapt so that's why that's why one of my concern when i'm trying to prepare this specification this is a specification you can use it you know from anywhere from different climate from different climate condition but we cannot standardize this is the point we cannot standardize the social aspect between people because the social and culture aspects in Nigeria it's different completely different in Jordan or in the MENA region so this point I think it must be to consider when set down and we are trying to find a solution for this increasing whether increasing in housing or demanding or for to find a solution for those people, they have they, they don't have any you know resources for good living condition. Yeah, oh, that's a good point. Uh, Payman, you can just stop sharing. Uh, you are still sharing your things. Uh, honestly, the things I just see is just missing in the any kind of uh, uh, housing no matter is a social housing, low cost housing, or just we call it in the uh, South Africa RDP, is the role of the end user. So we just design something, then we just deliver to the people. Yes, uh, Gonzalo, please. Yeah, I, I, would, I would say that you're right in pointing out that we are sometimes faster at developing technical standards than considering social issues. But I would also argue that there is another aspect that is often overlooked and is the urban, urban planning issues. Like we tend to separate urban planning with housing, but in reality, they're deeply connected. And sometimes we're not, again, we're faster at solving the house itself, you know, the, solving the standards for bedrooms and standards for roofs and, and not solving the standards for urban development. And we tend to see them separately from urban planning. And again, it's, it's, it's another major issue that requires more attention as much as social issues require attention and cultural issues require, require attention. I would say also the connection between housing and urban planning and stop, we need to stop seeing them as two separate spheres of the problem. We can have the best house in a remote area that is where there are no jobs and that house is not useful for, even if it's, technically perfect. It's not going to solve people's living conditions if it's not connected to schools, if it's not connected to roads, to jobs, to... So again, it's, it's, it's more complex than the technical aspects of the house itself. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we have a lot of good example of the things you just say. It's just a lot of free houses is just developed by some of the Middle East governments. But because of the location of the houses, it's just vacant and nobody just occupied that one. So we have lots of example of that one. You know, that's the issue. And also the, some of the research is just showing sometimes the people, they rather to just live in the smaller house or the older house in the CBD compared to just a bigger house outside, because especially for the low income or the middle income uh, level, the cost of the transportation is just very huge. Uh, yes, Chimso, please unmute yourself. We are listening to you. So the other thing that maybe is um, a bit difficult to talk around, simply by understanding that a lot of the cities that we currently live in, 
particularly in East Africa, um, are built on systems that were meant to divide. And that idea of bringing people together into a common space is very difficult. It's a huge, difficult problem that I don't think anybody has really gotten right 100%. So the core problem, I think, is also this understanding that people want to go where work is. Work is very far away from them. And they, um, they make these decisions to live in poor quality homes so that they can be closer to that opportunity that you know is um, the center of the city. And when we you know propose the idea of affordable housing, we also need to start thinking about affordable infrastructure and also talk about how to make things easier for those people to make the transition from these places where they could possibly afford decent homes to where they can't. Um, that transition itself is something that people don't um, consider. You know, I think when we speak to government, we understand that government has got a very difficult problem. And there's many voices giving solutions. Um, not all of them are easy to answer, but we can, I think, feasibly talk to that infrastructure issue and start talking about how we knit people back into the city or maybe make it easier for them to make that transition. Because I think that is the key reason why we start seeing these informal areas growing and growing and growing. It's because people don't have a place to land. Um, I think if we started talking to that issue, affordable housing could start to change, transform for the better, I think. Yeah, you're right. So it's just a matter of the listening to the both side, not listening to the one side. You know, as an end user, the people, maybe they don't know the value or the necessity of those rule and regulation or the process should be there. And also as a government, they need to listen to the end user. But we need to just also know, uh, or we need to optimize this process. In the previous workshop, we just highlighted some of these uh, processes just very necessary and it should be there. But the question, can we just reduce some of them? Can we just merge some of them? Can we just optimize some of this process to just make it faster or cheaper? Or at least we just make it transparent. I was talking with the, one of the home developer yesterday and uh, he was complaining about the process. But when I just explained the process, so he's just kind of satisfied and he's just kind of happy with the system. Sometimes the lack of knowledge, as you just mentioned, is just makes some problem. You are very right. Any other uh, last comment, question? Maybe one that we didn't address today is the connection between housing and economic activities. And mm. again, we tend to separate the residential component with income generation activities. Mm. And let us remember that about 40 to 45% of people living in informal conditions or in conditions of poverty work from home. Mm. And most of them are women who need to take care of children and elderly and because of cultural conditions are kind of uh, devoted to stay at home. So if we want to improve the living conditions of women, we particularly need to understand that housing is not about a residential problem. It's also an income generation problem. And that requires densities and that requires infrastructure and access to public transportation and so on. So again, we, we tend to separate those things and we have programs for economic progress and we have programs for housing, but we forget that when we reach the bottom of the social pyramid, those two things are often interconnected. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And this is exactly the case of the Cape Town or it's the case of the South Africa because the majority of the workers, especially domestic workers, they are living 40, 50 kilometers outside the CBD. So they need to just travel every day 50 kilometers in and out with the heavy traffic because you know the uh, condition of the Cape Town, only two highways is just in CBD and out CBD. So the traffic in the morning and in the afternoon is very hectic. Yes, Michael, please. Mike. Um, I assume you are referring to me. Thanks, Ali. Um, so I just wanted to agree with uh, what um, the, about the gap with regards to housing and economic activities. My question asking specifically about best associated with if um, city planners are in these conversations at all, 
because uh, the issue at the moment is that I think we're looking at one CBD and one city that everyone is trying to get at. But if city planners were part of those conversations as well, it would mean that uh, other considerations are, are around moving and creating other city hubs outside of where uh, already congested CBDs, like for example, in Cape Town, if you move further out um, and start creating economic hubs outside of the city, then it means the need to go there uh, reduces. Then if we then start creating solutions and housing solutions around new areas, then uh, we will solve a couple of issues. So I just wanted to ask from you, uh, Prof Ali, maybe if you are aware of uh, uh, the city itself, uh, along with developers, uh, having these conversations, because I have seen definitely that in other areas, um, here in South Africa, Cape Town, we have areas where, like for example, in Burgundy State, you have um, housing areas and they have put shopping malls there, but those are not for the informal uh, sector that we're referring to. So how, um, and it's still difficult for people to get to areas like uh, Burgundy State. And uh, that's now my question that how has the city and how are property developers looking um, and are they considering this group of, uh, of people? Uh, I'm not the right person to answer this question, but the things, uh, because my knowledge in, um, is not very uh, good, but the things I know in the city of the Cape Town, we uh, just try to look at the you know, two like a CBD because of the issue of the traffic and the other things we have it here. So they just try to put another CBD or similar to the CBD outside the uh, Cape Town which the people, they can just have that kind of shopping center, public uh, facility, uh, those kind of services, they just usually, they need to get it from the city. So they just do that one. But we need to just think about that one. COVID changed a lot of things. Now it's just pushing everything to just be like uh, uh, online or we call it uh, electrical uh, electronic governments. So all the things now is just go to the like a online system with this kind of investment on the infrastructure. So we need to think about that one. Maybe we can just facilitate the digitalization for this kind of system instead of investing in the like a, a hard infrastructure and just put it everywhere or something like that. Also in the uh, city of the Cape Town, as I see, uh, we have a lot of vacant building in the city, which at the night, nobody just used that one. You know, it's not like a, a 24 hour city. So if you just walking in the Cape Town at night, it's just very uh, dark. It's not too much people or is not too much activities happening on, only in the few uh, street or only in the few areas just happening. So it's just back to the point of the Gonzalo. We need to just bring the people in the place they just do the, those kind of economic activity, not just separate them and just put that one and say, this is the residential area, this is the commercial area, and this is, we need to just think about the new way of urban planning, how we just do that one. And the example of that one, you can just see in the East Asia or in the Europe, when the uh, land is not, available. So they just try to do that one. I'm not sure if other participants, they have any idea about that one or they have more information than me. Please come and just uh, put your idea or your understanding. Maybe here, if you allow me, Ali, uh, to, to, to give an example about uh, I think you are you 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 are raising a good point regarding to isolating people. So we cannot isolating people in a way, because if we the the government should do something similar, I think people they will create their own uh, job. They recreate their own you know way to live. Uh, and in this case, in this case, I think uh, uh, we have here in Jordan this case. It's regarding maybe you know that the the Bakakam. In Jordan, uh, uh, at the beginning, Al Baqa it was uh, just a tent, and now it's, um, it's, a, it's about an informal city. And people, uh, because at the first of uh, the, at, um, at, at the beginning, they are isolating just uh, 
in camp with tents and now it's an informal city it's full economy you know uh, they have a full economic situation they have they have their uh, own job they have their own markets okay and they are start they are st they were starting to to open uh, markets and so on and to build their to you know uh, their future uh, I think this is the case uh, if we isolating uh, uh, the people from the, 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 the host community. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. Any other uh, last comment question? Uh, I know we just passed the uh, one and a half hours for the workshop, but the conversation is just very nice and I don't want to just interrupt that one. So is there any last point Please feel free to just share with us. Um, I'll maybe um, just reinforce what um, Gonzalo was saying. Um, you know, it's, it really is about, and, and I'm not even going to call it political will. I think it's about the will of people um, to move towards um, an, a city that can be imagined for them um, that would be worth living in. Um, I think the numbers in Cape Town is not yet, you know, so the population is not yet that big, but we are on the cusp of um, becoming a, a mega city quite soon. Um, and, you know, I think that the city is in urgent need for, um, you know, a vision of how the city can be that doesn't um, create big distances, separations, ghettos. Um, and it is kind of, you know, reminding ourselves of the a vision we had for a shared South Africa. What is that vision for a shared city? And when we say it now, it seems so naive, but it is, you know, it remains a possibility. Um, and so I think that, you know, the work that we need to do is to keep reminding ourselves. Otherwise, we we start counting bricks and, you know, talking about, um, uh, you know, regulations and whatever, which is of no consequence in the greater scheme of things. So, so you know, for me, it's really a call for, you know, for, for, for a vision um, of how the city can be managed so that it's a, a wonderful livable city for everyone um, and without, you know, um, bringing in the money or the, you know, this, that, or the other, because how much do things cost? That's all relative as well. So anyway, that's from me, thanks. I think Sonia just wrapped the, wrap up the uh, workshop very well. I haven't uh, arranged with her, but she just come and just put the very nice uh, conclusion. So with the Sonia conclusion, I just uh, like to close the workshop. Thanks all of you. And we are just having the uh, third workshop, which is just talking about the housing market in the South Africa. One of my colleagues, Mac, uh, Rob McCoffin, he just uh, studied the housing market in the South Africa, and we just understand the housing market here is just not healthy and it's just broken. Uh, some of this reason is just highlighted in this workshop, which Gonzalo or the Rania or the payment just highlighted. Some of them is technical, social, and some of them it was uh, highlighted in the previous workshop with the um, uh, governments. So I just invite uh, all of you to just come and join us next week for the uh, third workshop, which is just focusing on the housing market and see, is there any problem? And if it's a problem, what is the problem? Because if we don't know the problem, we cannot solve or provide solution. Thank you very much. All the recording will be available soon on the CEO website. So you can just see the recording or you can just access to all this uh, excellent presentation. Have a nice day and keep safe. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.